In the Reading Corner today, I'm really thrilled to be welcoming Candace Chimbiri, who's going to be talking to us about her three historical books for children, including the most recent, which is Britain's Black Airmen. Now, we've had some fantastic black historians on uh, our podcast in the past, uh, Professor Hakim Adi and David Oloshoga. But you are ground roots, and I was so interested to read your story and how you came to be publishing these books. And I think we should start there. Yes, my story is a little different. I am not a trained historian at all. In fact, I describe myself as a Black history enthusiast. Um, I loved Black history from the time I was at secondary school in Barbados. I was born in the UK, I was born in London. My parents are part of the what we call now the Windrush generation. They came from Barbados in the 60s. They met here and we lived in Lewisham in South London. And I had my primary school education there. And then my parents went back to Barbados and they took my sister and they took me, of course. And um, I had all my secondary education there. And it wasn't until I was actually about 28 that I decided to come back to London and so you could almost say I was sort of repeating what my parents had done and my job was admin but I still was interested in history and I also was still interested in books and this is how I became an author it wasn't something that I thought about as a child but when I went into big bookshops in London and saw all these thousands of books. And, you know, that was amazing coming from a small island like Barbados. And then you can go into a bookshop with thousands of books. And I particularly was looking at the time for children's books about history to send to friends in Barbados and for friends here that were having children. And I was shocked, really shocked, disappointed. And yeah, I just couldn't believe that there was such a small selection of books, usually perhaps six at most for Black History Month, African-American history being the main focus, sometimes Nelson Mandela as well, but nothing about Black British history, nothing about the history of all these places that had been part of the British Empire in Africa and the Caribbean, nothing, you know, the history that I'd learned at school. And I was just so shocked. And that's how I decided then to start writing Black history books for children on the side. So I started that about, oh, maybe about 14 years ago now. I just started self-publishing and writing books myself. I reached out to some museums and I would do things like tours on Saturdays, learn from people. And that's how it came about. So I'm not a trained historian at all. Now, I mentioned three books, but if you've been writing for 14 years, are there more books? Yes, I actually self-published four books in about 10 years. I wish I'd done more, but it was difficult because I just sort of jumped into the self-publishing and didn't realise, oh, you have to do the marketing, the posting, the books, the invoicing, the everything. You know, it wasn't just the research and the writing the books and then having them, you know, printed, paying and having them printed. But I did actually do four books. Um, Step Back in Time to Ancient Kush was my first one. That was kind of like a test. It was an activity book about the ancient Sudan, using many of the artifacts that I'd seen in museums right here in the UK. And it was popular. I sold about 4,000 copies. So that then helped me to do the next book, which is about ancient Egypt. And then I wrote a book called Secrets of the Afro Comb which was a book that was sold alongside some other titles at the Fitzwilliam Museum in particular, because they had an exhibition called Origins of the Afro Cone. Wow. So there were three ancient history books that I did. And then I decided in 2017 to write a small book, my first hardback one, called The Story of the Windrush. And that was the first Black British history book I'd done. And I sort of did it in a style of a book that I thought I should have seen in the 1970s. and Almost like a ladybird book, like a lady, that kind of yes. look to it, yeah. Yes, and that was because I thought to myself, 2018, the next year, is the 70th arrival of the Windrush, and I wasn't seeing books like that for children. And I thought, you know, this was actually my parents' story as well, although I didn't write it about my parents, I wrote about the whole Windrush generation. So the books that I'm writing, I, I, I try to do them to sort of address the things that we haven't done in the past. 
I want to go to the most recent book. I think it came out earlier this year, actually, your book about Afro hair. Yes. Now, that's been really popular. It's a fantastic book. So tell us a bit about that. The idea for that book began to formulate, I'd say, in 2013, when I was part of the Origins of the Afro Comb exhibition. And that was all about African combs and certain styles of combs for certain hair textures from ancient Egypt right up to the modern black fist comb. And I noted when I was doing the workshops for children and so on, that a lot of the people were interested in artifacts and history, but a lot of them weren't. Many of them were just interested in it because it was to do with combs and combs are related to hair. And so I think from then I had the idea that we should have a book a bit more about the hair and the hairstyles. But what I wanted to do with this book was something a little bit different in that I wanted it to be a book that wouldn't necessarily be about history for people who are interested in history, but maybe people would learn the history more indirectly. So interesting. And um, we're coming now to uh, the book that's about to be published, actually, uh, Britain's Black Airmen. And this is an absolutely fascinating uh, read. I suppose I want to know what led you to this particular group of people to write about. So the idea for this book, funny enough, came out of the Windrush book. And as it was self-published, I chose all the photos in the book. And the last photo in the book is a photo of a group of men on board the Windrush ship in 1948 when it had arrived. And I chose the picture because at the back of the group is Sam King, who had fought for Britain during the World War, Second World War. He was an engineer and he was part of ground crew and he returned to Jamaica and then he came back on the Windrush. And that was the focus of the book. And I chose that photo because he was in it and I liked the way that he was right at the back of this group of men. And that's why I chose it. But in the front of the group of men, there are two RAF men speaking to Sam King and the others. And one of them is a tall, thin black man in RAF uniform. And I looked at the photo at the time when I chose it and I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I thought nothing more of it. And then after the book was out, I was looking at it and it hit me one day. I was sitting down and it hit me. That's a gentleman called Johnny Smythe. And I knew Johnny Smythe's story. And I knew that he had been a navigator during the Second World War. And I became really obsessed with that photo. And I was just captivated by the fact that there were two black historic figures that I knew of in the same photo. And the idea just grew from there. And I just thought, yes, we need to have a book. Originally, I thought of only writing about the black navigators like Johnny Smythe, because that in itself is a whole story. But when I saw that 2018 was also RAF 100. I realised, well, it's a small book, but I will have to try and put in a little bit more than Navigators. I'll have to mention some of the pilots. I'll have to mention the ground crew. And then I realised I'd also have to mention not many, but there were actually a few men who served during the First World War as well. Mm -hmm. So that's how it all came about, really. Lots to ask you about various things that you've talked about there. Um, But I think I'm going to ask you a publishing question first, which is about photographs, because purchasing things to put in books, it's expensive to produce a book, isn't it? Uh, And I'm really impressed with the photographs. I do think photographs are important, as well as Elizabeth Lander's wonderful portraits, too. And it gives a veracity to the work. And there's something very moving about seeing a real photograph. I find it really interesting that you make that comment, Nikki, because usually adults say to me that they love the drawings. But what you said is very, very true, because I noticed that most children say to me they like the photos. And when I ask the children why, they say, oh, because we know it was real and we know it was true. Mm -hmm. So children, it's amazing that you say that because I myself thought, oh, lovely drawings. And of course, the drawings are absolutely important. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we all love them. But I know that having the photos in the book, it really does something to the children to understand, oh, this is real, real stories as opposed to a made up story. I agree. I'm a real advocate for photographs in historical books um, and and other books, you know, science books as well. 
Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the way that you've written this and perhaps to go through some of the uh, chapters. The introduction, in a very um, accessible and gentle way, you explain the issues around class in Britain in 19th century and then gender, and then you set race in with those other inequalities in society. Do you see them as being very firmly connected? Yes, and I think this is something that is really important to remember because obviously I'm very, very happy that we have Black History Month and I really think we do need to talk about Black history. But we still must always keep in the back of our mind that no histories are discrete or disconnected from each other. They all interrelate. And I think sometimes there's a danger of people forgetting that these things are happening in a context and that there are other things are happening as well. You know, so yes, race is extremely important. But for example, sometimes people say to me, well, are there any women in the book? Well, as a black woman, it would have been virtually impossible to do these things. It was difficult enough for the black men. But you've got to remember that there's also the issues of gender at the same time and people's perceptions of what a woman could do. Even white women at this time, you know, during the Second World War, weren't expected to do war work or weren't expected to fly planes. I mean, they did have fighter pilots in, I think, the Soviet Union, maybe some other countries. But in Britain, you know, we didn't expect women to do that. Even some of the black airmen, when they came to Britain, they were surprised to see women driving trucks. And, you know, so all of these things, they do interrelate. And we have to remember that things are happening in a context as well. So I do very much think it is important. And I think it's important to get children to understand the whole picture. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes I think people think, well, this was happening, but something else wasn't happening. And it, a lot of things were happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now, race often will be more important than some of the other things in a person's experience, but they also have other things that are going on. Class, is colour, you know, all these other things as well. You start with two men who um, were flying in the First World War. And how did they come to be doing this? Alexander Patterson, he has only come to light relatively recently. And it's because his descendants were do one of his descendants was doing his family tree. So he's white, he was doing his family tree and didn't even know that this was his uh, ancestor. <gasps> and he sort of alerted some museums and you know, yeah, and that's how I found out about it. So there are many people in Britain today, not not the majority, but there are many white British people in Britain today who may not even know that they had an ancestor who came from another part of the British Empire, you know, could be black or even you know, could be other parts as well. So that's how his story came about. And the, the documents are there, but it was just that no one really connected all the dots or knew everything about it. Some of the family knew, but the uh, another side of the family didn't know. And that was the side that was doing the um, family tree. Were you getting your story from families then or from museums? Where were you? Both. I was I was alerted first by the museum and then I was able to interview um, one of the family members and uh, speak to him all about his research and then follow up online and um, looking in the records. And that's how I found out. Unfortunately, um, there was no autobiography left, so I could only say what you know, I could verify. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of information about his feelings and you know, there are some gaps. But yeah, he did mm -hmm. that and he flew six different planes um, and he was more on the technical side. And that's how his story came to light. Since then, I have seen uh, images of more black airmen during mm -hmm. the Second, uh, First World War and in the RFC. But again, not much information. So they did exist. Mm -hmm. They definitely were there. And then William Robinson Clark from Jamaica, his story is a bit better known than um, Alexander Patterson's story. And he was actually the first black combat pilot and he came from Jamaica. And there are records about that in Jamaica as well. But even in Jamaica, 
I wouldn't say his story is that well known either. That's one of the things that struck me reading your book, uh, particularly when we come to the Second World War. Uh, One was how many of the young men that you were writing about went on to be political activists or to have a real important role, either as you know, prime ministers or as lawyers. Uh, That was really fascinating to read what happened to them. Uh, But also that their stories were probably not well known in the islands or the places that they'd come from. Uh, You know, it was as misty there as it was here. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, taking Barbados, for example, and Errol Barrow, you know, our first prime minister, the father of independence is his name in Barbados. And we know about him and, you know, going to school in Barbados, we will learn about some of the social contributions he made and the political contributions, did not hear anything about his service in the Second World War. In fact, we don't really even learn a lot about the Second World War. I see a lot of it on TV. And if you watch movies, there's a lot about it, but you don't actually learn about it much in school. So again, that this side of it is being overlooked. And I think part of it, as I say in the book, I think part of it is because when you live in a post-colonial society, your focus is more on Mm. post-colonial matters, really. But I think understanding this history is really important, not just for people here in Britain, but also for people in the colonies as well, or the ex-colonies, I should say. Were you able to uncover in your research much about, you know, these young men's motivation for wanting to come and fight in the British Air Service? I mean, for instance, there was um, the young man that came from Sierra Leone. Johnny Smythe. Yeah, and I was trying to get inside his head and as to why you would come to do that. That's one of the things that's really been a little bit frustrating in trying to do this because... Same with him, same with Errol Barrow. You know, we don't have enough written information at the time about what they felt and why they wanted to do it. We do have some. So Cy Grant, he did write a book about his experiences in the RAF, which I mention in the uh, book. And there are a couple others who talked a bit about it in interviews, you know, sometimes later on in life as well. So there are the different motivations, some of them maybe did feel that as citizens of the British Empire, it was their duty, despite what happened. But I know at the time in the Caribbean and in Africa, there definitely were many people who did say black people should not fight for Britain. Definitely. There was um, a gentleman in West Africa, forget his name. He was locked up for the duration of the war. And there was also a man in Jamaica who also wrote an article. He later became an author and um, he was also locked up. There was a report called the Moyne Report, which was looking just before the war at conditions in the Caribbean and how poor they were. And there had been riots in many of the colonies at the time because of the poor conditions, which really hadn't changed in 100 years since the end of slavery and in many cases had actually declined. And the report was sort of suppressed because, you know, the authorities felt if people started talking about this report or reading this report, it would uh, lessen support for the war effort. So it wasn't really until after that, you know, people talked about it a bit more. So some of them wanted, I think, to get away from the poor conditions. You know, they were young men. They are black men living in colonies, but they are seeing some of the same media that we're seeing here at the time. And they see themselves sometimes just wanting to be in planes, wanting to fly, wanting to be doing something different. Cy Grant said he wanted to escape the boredom and monotony of life in a colony at the time. For some of them, there weren't many opportunities. Mm -hmm. So there were a whole set of reasons. And many of them, some of the ground crews experiences I've read in a book, they said that they knew people were saying they shouldn't fight for Britain, but they still decided to do it anyway. One man said he just went because his friends were going, so he decided to go too. As many motivations as there are people at the end of the day. Exactly. Um, Another thing that struck me when I was reading your book was 
how things changed between the First and the Second World War. Yes. Suddenly, after Alexander Patterson and William Clark, it became illegal to fly. You had to be of, was it pure European descent? Yes, yes, that was actually the rule. And I have to say, to be fair, the RAF, even with that, was still better than the other branches of the armed forces, because at least, you know, the RAF did eventually begin to take people who were not of pure European descent. But even during the Second World War, it was still, you know, much harder with the army and with the navy as well. But yes, that was basically the rule. And again, this is where I think the element of class, not that it takes away from the race, but I think it's also important to remember that even white working class men at that time would have found it difficult to get into the flying corps or later the RAF. I mean, it did change. The RAF did change. Mm -hmm. I think it had to change eventually. But this is what we need to remember. We're in a time where your class is really important and then you've got race on top of that. In recent years, we've, you know, heard reports of minorities, not only to do with race, being not so well treated in the forces. Yeah. Uh, I wondered whether it existed for these men during this time uh, in the Second World War. Do we know much about how they related with their other officers and peers? This is something that I would like um, historians to have another look at. Because when I've been reading books around this to do the research, obviously, I get the feeling that in Britain, we're very often guilty of um, comparing ourselves to America and wanting to see ourselves in a favourable light. So there's a lot of people who will sort of say things to the effect that America was bad. It was, you know, the Air Force was segregated. I mean, they didn't even really want to have the Tuskegee Airmen at first, but it happened and it was segregated. In Britain, we didn't do that great. I think that is sort of glossing over the experiences. Yes, the men, the airmen in the Second World War were integrated, but that doesn't mean that they all had a great experience. Generally speaking, I would say the air crew seemed to have had better experiences than the ground crew. And again, this could be related a little bit to the issues of class. We need to kind of tease this out a bit more. But there were people who did have bad experiences. I mean, there was a colour bar in Britain at the time. So obviously the airmen would have needed to know where they could go, where they couldn't go. Some of them had, and they've said this, they had fights with people. And it wasn't always white American men. There is one man who said, I didn't quote him in the book, but there is one man who was ground crew. He said, I came to fight an Italian and a German, and I ended up fighting an American and a British man. Words wow. to that effect. And that's just the reality of it. I also think that we need to recognise that people at that time seem to have accepted things that maybe we wouldn't find acceptable today. And that's why I want to make the point that about class and gender and race. People were born into society where I think they were raised to accept that if you belong to this group, this gender, whatever, this race class, you can do this and others can't do that. So some of the experiences that they would have had, we would look back on them today and recognise that those were racist. They may not have responded to all of them in the same way. Important point. I just want to make a comment, really, that I appreciated in the writing again it only gets a little little piece because you know it it's it moves along quickly at a pace your book but you did mention that some people were kind and took them into their homes and some weren't and i think that's very important because sometimes there are assumptions that everybody hated these people nobody you know had any friends nobody um looked out for people and that actually is a distortion of the truth yes. as well. Yes, exactly. And um, people and yeah, and that's why it is important to mention that as well. Generally speaking, I think um, many of the airmen had positive experiences and positive interactions with most of the British people, the white British people that they came in contact with. Sam King mentioned that people often invited them into his home and he said the the homes were cold. 
<laughs> so the homes were cold, but at least I could see that the hearts were warm. So that was good. That's nice. Know, yeah. And I know from reading that some of the people themselves didn't really know how people were being treated in other parts of the empire. So they knew that Britain had an empire. They were proud of being, you know, white British people and having this big empire bigger than what the Germans had and what everyone else had. But I don't think they really understood how things were in those colonies. So when they met some of these black airmen, for many of them, it was the first time to actually really understand the consequences of empire. And they weren't always pleased. They were Sometimes they were ashamed when they realised how people were treated in the colonies and how things were set up. So, you know, it's a two-way thing as well. So I I feel there's so much more that I could uh, talk to you about, but there is one burning question. Who are you going to write about next? Oh, I am not allowed to say, Nikki. I'm sworn to secrecy. But what I would say is I think it's going to complement this book. I think I can say that. Okay, I won't (laughs) press you on that, but I do look forward to, to hearing what that's about. It's been such a pleasure talking to you today and an education so thank you so much thank you so much for having me nikki in the reading corner is presented by nikki gamble and produced by alison hughes this episode is generously sponsored by scholastic children's books if you have enjoyed this podcast please leave us a review if you would like to find out about other events and courses visit justimagine.co.uk join us again in the reading corner on your favourite podcast platform.